Mark Morris, welcome to Viral History. First question, why did the Norman Conquest matter? The Norman Conquest matters because it is the single biggest change that England ever experiences. The fact that William defeated Harold at Hastings on the 14th of October 1066 causes enormous change. Um, the biggest change at the time was that the aristocracy of Anglo-Saxon England was swept away. Thousands and thousands of people who had been in charge of England, the earls, the thanes, and all their um, underlings, around about 8,000 people are within a generation replaced by a class of people who speak a different language, i.e. French, and who have a different set of ideas in their heads. So their Normans do warfare differently. They build castles. Not only do they sit on horseback and do cavalry tactics, they build castles, which were a, a brand new foreign imposition on England. They fill the land with hundreds and hundreds of castles. They rebuild every single major church, every cathedral and every major abbey is ripped down and replaced. So they have different attitudes to warfare, they have different attitudes to architecture, they have different attitudes to human life itself. The Normans abolished slavery. The English had regarded the bottom 10 or 20% of the population as slaves, no better than beasts in the field, people with no rights at law at all, who could be branded or beaten or even killed by their owners. Um, the Normans do away with that. At the same time, the Normans introduce chivalry which means they spare their opponents once they have defeated them. They don't, as the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons have done, kill them when they're on their knees begging for mercy. Um, now, these are big changes um, because these, these attitudes, these new attitudes, filter down very quickly to the rest of the English population. And they mean that by the 12th century, when the English start looking at their neighbours in the British Isles, i.e., the Welsh, the Scots and the Irish, they start to see this big difference in the way that each, each of them do warfare, for example, the way each of them treat other human beings. And they decide, as they start to invade these countries, that the people they're invading are barbarians, that they are going into these countries as a civilising mission. So the Norman conquest affects the way that the English perceive their Celtic neighbours and it, it underpins it gives a rationale for the invasions of those Celtic countries for the rest of the Middle Ages and way beyond. In what way was it a righteous conquest for William of Normandy? First of all, in 1066, one of the first things he does um, when he realises that he is going to have to fight Harold for the throne is he appeals to the Pope to get the Pope's blessing. Um, and William, we know since his boyhood, or at least since his teens, has been under the personal tutelage of a very, at the time, very celebrated um, scholar called Lamfranc of Beck. So this, this internationally famous theologian has schooled William and affected many of William's beliefs. And you can see in William, I think, the almost um, like a proto-crusading or a, a sort of puritanical Christianity. Um, so he's convinced of the righteousness of his claim. And I think this is crucial to understanding why William embarks upon the conquest and why he thinks it's possible, because you, you tend in some books to see William represented as just another Norman or continental chancer. You know, he's ju it's just a punt, the Norman conquest, nothing more. He's doing it because England is a rich country. Now, that's true, England is a rich country, and there must be many hundreds of thousands of people in William's army who are doing it because they think they'll make themselves rich. But I think William himself, it's an insanely risky undertaking. If you look at his warfare up to that point, it's been cautious, he's been careful to avoid battle, it's been attritional. To raise an army and a fleet to commit yourself to the wind, to risk shipwreck and bad weather, to land on foreign soil, to fight an unknown enemy, um, is literally to commend the justice of your cause to the judgment of God. And so William you know, is, is, is that kind of mentality. He thinks he's right, he knows he's right, and he's putting his case before God. And what were the practical consequences of the conquest to the people of England? 
in the first instance, um, the Norman conquest causes huge loss of human life. I mean, the Battle of Hastings, we don't know how many people were fighting on each side. Some historians would say, you know, more than 10,000 each side, others as few as 5,000. But however big the armies, the body count was huge. We know it was a very bloody battle, not just Harold that got killed, but his brothers and countless hundreds, maybe thousands of other Englishmen, as well as Normans. So that the, the battlefield the next day is strewn with bloodied um, bodies. Thereafter, uh, the Battle of Hastings is just the beginning of the Norman Conquest. It's not that, you know, uh, William takes over and then the Anglo-Saxons accept him. The first four or five years of William's reign are ones of constant insurgency and rebellion by the English and repression by the Normans, increasingly violent repression. So William is marching into various bits of the country, in the West Country, the Midlands and the North, planting castles and um, putting down um, English rebellions with extreme prejudice. So there are tens of thousands of people being killed in those years of rebellion. The most devastating uh, result of the Norman Conquest happens in Yorkshire, or points north of the River Humber, when at the end of this cycle of rebellions, William decides he's never going to be able to hold northern England by peaceful means or by planting castles and leaving garrisons in them. His, his very barbaric solution, brutal solution, is to simply break up his army into small units and send them around the various towns and villages north of the Humber to destroy the crops and the animals. Incidentally, lots of people get killed in that process. It's known as harrying. And it's a perfectly normal, and as contemporaries would have seen it, legitimate way of waging war. But the scale on which William does it shocks contemporaries because he lays waste to everything north of the Humber, making it incapable of supporting animal life and human life. And so the consequence is lots of people may be killed in the harrying process, but tens of thousands spilling over into a six-figure number, more than 100,000 people perish as a result of the famine that follows. So the consequences of the Norman Conquest for the English people were, in the first instance, terrible. This was a very brutal, very violent conquest. The land is filled with castles. They are now second-class citizens in their own country. Alternate history is very much in vogue at the moment with programmes like uh, the man in the high castle. If we applied that to Hastings and Harold had won, what would a longer period of Anglo-Saxon rule have looked like? I think it would have been very different. I think today, perhaps after 950 years, we wouldn't notice the differences obviously that much because we're talking about nearly a millennium having passed. I think the one big difference we'd notice even today is that the, the words I'm saying now, the language we speak, is of course heavily dependent on the, it's, it, uh, Old English's fusion with Norman French. So we wouldn't have nearly so many French loan words and the, the, the language would be closer to the, the language spoken by the Anglo-Saxons. Um, we wouldn't have certainly as many castles because castles are introduced as a result of the conquest as military installations. Um, so all the changes that come about as a result of the conquest, um, the, the, the point about the conquest is they happen very quickly within the space of one or two generations. So you get castles, cathedrals, massive, massive change. Many of those things may have happened after the conquest in a much more piecemeal, long drawn out way. So you would have had a sprinkling of castles. You would have had the gradual replacement of old English churches with um, Romanesque Norman churches. But the totality of the Norman conquest uh, means that much of, much of the culture that had uh, existed up to 1066 is erased. So m many of the literary treasures are lost, many of the artistic treasures are lost, almost all of the major churches are pulled down and replaced. So we would have more surviving Anglo-Saxon history and the transition to what we think of as a high Middle Ages would have been much more long drawn out. Turning to King John, another area of study for you. It's 800 years now since King John's death at Newark Castle. Is his terrible reputation deserved? Uh, yes, I mean, in a nutshell. I thought you were gonna say, is his reputation deserved without qualifying it? And of course, his reputation in recent years has been improved because uh, some scholars in the 20th century looked afresh at the evidence and decided John wasn't as bad as medieval people had claimed. They looked at the 
products of his um, writing office. They looked at basically administrative documents and said, look how dynamic he is. Look how conscientious he appears to be in doing justice. Look how industrious he is in um, doing the business of kingship. But the problem with that rehabilitation is you have to discard all of the contemporary evidence, the chronicles, both lay and ecclesiastical, in unison telling us what a jerk the man was. So that's very easy to discard it when it is so across the board. The other thing is, even judged by his own actions, even if you didn't have that chronicle evidence, John's actions are beyond the pale, even by medieval standards. So if you look, for example, people think of the Middle Ages as a brutal time. It should be, you know, maybe it was compared to the, the modern age, but then we have brutalities in, in the age in which we live. Um, but this is a period, the period in which John lives is a period where, for example, it is not politically acceptable to do away with, to murder your political enemies. It's a period of high chivalry. So if you capture someone, you imprison them, you can keep them in comfortable captivity for years. If they promise to behave, you might eventually ransom them. What you're not allowed to do, what is absolutely taboo, is kill them. And what does John do to his nephew Arthur when he captures him in 1203, uh, 1202? He kills him or makes him disappear the following year in 1203. What does John do when he captures the wife of William de Brios, Matilda de Brios, and her son, her adult son? He starves them to death in one of his castle dungeons. What does John do with Arthur's supporters in 1202? He starves them to death en masse in Corfe Castle. This is not acceptable. This kind of Game of Thrones style behaviour was not acceptable in this period of the Middle Ages. Um, and John was condemned by contemporaries for his cruelty and his cowardice. How far did King John's misrule create the conditions in which a mechanism like Magna Carta had to be created in order to avoid war with the barons? Well, I think Magna Carta, um, there are historians who would rightly look for antecedents far earlier than John. So they would say, if you look at certain clauses in Magna Carta, these grievances on the part of the barons stretch way back to the time of his brother Richard, to the time of his father Henry II, arguably even further back into the 12th century past. So th there is, in, in some people's view, uh, a sense in which John is simply the patsy at the end of this process. He's the man who happens to be king when the lid finally you know, explodes off the pot. But I have only you know, limited patience with that argument because, because, as we've already said, John is such a terrible person. And clearly people had tolerated the abuses of power um, of Henry II and Richard because they were on a lesser scale. But John, precisely because he preys on the women folk of his barons, because he deprives people of their property with such sort of authoritarian disregard for the law, he provokes enough people to say not only we need to rein him in or we need to get rid of him even, but we need to make sure no one in future behaves this badly. So I see, and I'm not alone in seeing this because I think contemporaries saw it as well, that, that, uh, that Magna Carta um, was John's particular fault. And what's next for you? Well, I've done a very short biography of William the Conqueror, which has just come out, and I'm hopefully, this is the plan, going backwards in time a bit before that now to do the Anglo-Saxons. So, but that is a big period. I've, no, I've, I've only done previously sort of 100, 150 years at a stretch. I'm now proposing to undertake six or seven centuries of history. So there's a lot to get through. Mark Morris, thank you. You're very welcome. Nice to speak to you too.